intelligencesquared.com. Good evening, everybody. My name is Nick Gowing, and my job is to make sure that uh, we have a robust exchange of views for and against the motion between now and 8 o'clock, and we will end at 8 o'clock promptly. Now, I hope all of you have uh, voted on your way in, because we want to find out how the remarks from the six panellists up here will have changed your views, if at all. And therefore, we will make a comparison between the vote uh, you uh, made when you came in and a vote later on. And in case uh, you're still not quite sure how to do that, you should have a card in your hand or somewhere about your person. If you haven't, please ask for one, because it says for and against. And if still, um, at about quarter to eight, you're not sure what you think, then put the whole card into the box. But I hope all of you will at least have a clearer view after we've heard the remarks from uh, those up here. And also, I'll be opening it up uh, in around 50 minutes from now for you to contribute to help sway the debate one way or the other. And the panelists for and against will then be able to respond uh, either to detail or to what you're saying, disagree, agree, uh, and it'll be uh, a definite contribution to the discussion. We're really talking about the Jasmine Revolution, the Arab Spring withering in North Africa or the Middle East. Um, and will it provide the economic and political dividends? Uh, youth and what is now being called so loosely the street are seeking. Our speakers will each have eight minutes. I will stretch it to nine minutes, but it won't go to ten. Um, and that is an important discipline because otherwise you won't get um, a chance to say anything uh, between now and a quarter to eight. So those uh, are the ground rules, and as I say, we will finish promptly at 8 o'clock. I will introduce each of those speaking for and against the motion uh, as they speak. Uh, for their opening remarks, they'll go to the podium. Uh, our first speaker uh, for the motion is Nora Ayman, who's a 23-year-old uh, corporate analyst at the National Bank of Egypt. Nora graduated from Cairo University in the Faculty of Economics and Political Science. We're delighted to see you here. Yes, the floor you. is yours for maximum nine minutes. Thank you. Good evening. First of all, I'm not here to show my disagreement with democracy as a concept, as it's something I believe in and I'm looking forward to witnessing the Arab region. I'll focus my, on my own experience in Egypt tonight to argue that the conditions are not yet present that would allow democracy to deliver on the expectations that the youth are seeking. Democracy is not an end, and it takes a decade to examine and evaluate its changes, and depends first and foremost on the existence of its culture, and it needs Democrats to apply it. And this does not happen by day and night. Uh, consequently, I will make three points. The first point, there is not enough of a, of a political culture of dialogue in Egypt. And second, the Egyptian media has made divisions worse, not better. And the third point, the people are now dividing despite the need for unity in Egypt. So my first point, in Egypt, there are so many political powers with different ideologies, such as the Muslim Brotherhood, the liberals, the leftists, the Islamists, and newly established parties. Yet the problem here does not lie in the coexistence of these groups together, but lies in the way these groups are interacting with each other. Under the slogan of democracy, these groups have little concerns for the rights of others. Uh, many are focusing narrow uh, interests to, to, to focus on, uh, to rule the country uh, and enforce their ideas, their beliefs, uh, failing to give much at attention about the future prospects of the country. The question is, where is the national agenda? Egyptians are objecting to attitudes that they do not agree with in a manner of condemnation and skepticism and mistrust. There is still an urgent need to accommodate to pluralism and comprehend that intolerance and offending each other do not conform to the principles of democracy. The spirit of Tahrir Square was one of a national unity. It is a model to represent how far we were from issues of sectarianism, social and gender unrest, all of these mainly the creation of the former regime and its security forces. But this spirit of unity failed to disseminate from Tahrir Square to the Egyptian street. For the first time, Egyptian citizens voted on the constitutional amendments on March 19th. And this reinforces my point again. There was no agreement to disagree. Interest groups were challenging each other to prove their dominance on, over each other. And the lines were divided in a way that is not helping. There were many misleading campaigns from both sides, those who vote yes and those who vote no. There was a lack of a political culture of dialogue. 
and there was a manipulation from both sides. If you vote yes, you are probably ignorant. If you, are, if you vote no, you are probably unpatriotic. The poorly educated citizens and the unaware crowd are not to blame. Rather, it is those people who think they have reached the level of awareness to govern the country and expected citizens to naturally conform to their beliefs. And moving to my second point, I have a question. What is the most effective way to control people? The answer is not money, nor power. The answer is mind control. The media apparatus is exact, exact, exacerbating uh, divisions. It is using the same tones of the old regime, even after the revolution, spreading hatred and stressing so much on the differences that set people apart. For, for example, without verification, rumors spread that the Islamists cut the ear of a Christian man while it was later confirmed that a former state security officer committed this crime. Uh, news reports underscored the strikes in Upper Egypt calling for bringing down their governor because he is a Christian, while later it was found that some Christians themselves disagreed on him to continue governing. The news flash highlighting some Christian women converting to Islam is intensifying clashes between Egyptians, regardless that this type of exaggeration is overrated and in the meantime, deepening sectarian strife. Under the old regime, there were, the little, there were little chances to be taught in schools about politics. There is no basic education about the principles of democracy, and yet, the, and, and still, there is a lack of democratic political culture, uh, which was de which was demonstrated in the referendum results, where many Egyptians I saw voted according to personal views and interests because they were either lazy to read or chose to conform to what, to what the majority is saying. The old Egyptian educational system utterly failed to establish democratic values and depended on memorizing study courses rather than investigating, analyzing, and, and, and resulted in killing problem-solving skills and analytical skills in Egyptians. And accordingly, many people still lack awareness of, of the true meaning of democracy. The trend is now calling for a better Egypt and a better future regional role without analyzing much the goals and the targets that we want to reach and the obstacles that we must overcome. Many citizens are limiting their thinking of who's going to be the next president and abuse the concept of democracy through talking more, freely expressing themselves, but doing little when it comes to practice, which moves me to my third point. On February 2nd, the protesters united in Tahrir Square against the attacks of the camels and the horses, which gave hope that the people will unite to confront difficulties in the post-revolution phase. But the unity has not survived when it comes to confronting economic challenges. The country's economy is now struggling. There is capital flight, reduced income from tourism, declining remittances with expatriates fleeing from Libya. However, an empty belly does not vote, and we need to satisfy the basic needs through long-run investment plans for a stable and, de and a democratic future. But strikes spread widely among employees in many governmental sectors, companies, and institutions where they mostly demanded ha having higher wages and the top management to quit, deriving their legitimacy from the revolution. However, the demands of the strikes do not satisfy the critical conditions of economic progress, where higher wages need to meet with higher productivity as well. Before benefiting out of democracy, people should be ready to rationalize politically, economically, and socially. Political rationality means melting primitive loyalty, and the loyalty must be addressed to the state, not to a person, a family, a tribe, social class, or even a political party. Economic rationality means people must rationalize and evaluate the consequences of their actions on the economy. It is inconsistent to call for democracy with no long-run vision for investments, transparency, achieving goals and targets, and so on. Social rationality means seeking unity in our diversities between Muslims and Christians and other religious groups, between the working middle and upper class, between men and women, and remember that we are all Egyptians. People are attracted in Egypt to intense debate about the trade-offs between the civil and the religious state, between socialism and capitalism and liberalism, but there is not the required agreement on the basic steps towards the establishment of a democratic state. Egypt, Tunisia, and the Arab countries must remember that neither the French Revolution, nor the Industrial Revolution in England, nor the Amer American Revolution provided immediate results of effectiveness. For example, it took the French Revolution decades to give birth to, the f to a functioning French Republic and adopt the foundations of human rights. Governing is like a tunnel, uh, where th at the end there is a spotlight. And for us, democracy is still a dark tunnel, and we still don't know where we are heading to. We should pave the way to achieve democracy. But as long as the culture of pluralism has not taken root, democracy will not provide us with the economic gains we need. The revolution has brought down the politicians who governed us. 
but evolution is what is needed to bring the, to power those people who should govern us. And therefore, I, I urge you, ladies and gentlemen, to vote for the motion. Thank you. Nora, thank you very much indeed, and for keeping to time as well. Let's move on to the first voice uh, against the motion, another Egyptian, 33-year-old Ahmed Naguib, who's uh, advising and exchanges director for Amid East in Cairo, a prominent mobilizer of the younger generation in the Egyptian revolution back at the end of January. Good evening, Ahmed, everyone. Thank you. Yours. Thank you. Uh, let me quote an Arab poet, uh, who said, if a nation chooses the life of freedom, then destiny should allow it. Egypt has reached an irreversible point of no return. We will no longer tolerate dictatorships, corruption, and mismanagement of our country. We have reached a point where no one can go back. There's only forward. Now, there are definitely challenges. Um, Unlike many of the revolutions that we're all uh, familiar with, that my colleague here mentioned, none of them had similar birth and course. This revolution is unprecedented by all measures. Um, interestingly enough, Egypt at the time of Mubarak, just last year, was projected to be uh, one of the most important emerging, emerging um, economies. Uh, an HSBC report in two October 2010 mentioned that Egypt will become the number 17 country in importance uh, uh, of uh, its importance of um, its industrialization, its linking with other economies. Now, if you take corruption and bureaucracy out of the equation and the mismanagement of the billions, if not trillions, of US dollars, Egyptians were quite shocked with the numbers that we were uh, listening to uh, during the revolution and nowadays of the embezzlements. There are funds that were hidden from the budget that amounted to 200, uh, pardon me, 1.2 trillion Egyptian pounds, which amounts to 200 billion US dollars. That's unaccounted for. Imagine if those were allocated uh, to social benefits, to infrastructure, what would happen? I think those projections would even uh, surpass our expectations. Let me tell you something about what we are currently doing. Um, now there's a great sense of ownership in Egypt. Egyptians felt that this was not their country during Mubarak's time. We have a great sense of ownership. And this sense of ownership is giving us strength, a stakeholder in this country. And that's why we will not allow for things to go uh, downhill. The toppling of the previous corrupt regime that benefited mostly a small group of cronies that should help the economies, the economic gains trickle down and be distributed more equitably among the population of the Arab countries. Corruption is considered a major cost of investment and it was an impediment to the uh, domestic and international investors. The, mis the mismanagement of financial resources had created social injustice. As I mentioned to you, not just $200 billion uh, were missing from the budget on an annual basis. The mismanagement resulted in around 3.5 annual waste. Coupled with legislative reforms and taxation reforms, the reallocation of this money could go to the infrastructure, to the social welfare, a lot of um, um, investments could be attracted this way as well. Redirected revenues of the Suez Canal specifically. Imagine that 3.5 billion US dollars annually were given to the presidential institution. This practice denied the country of a very important uh, source of foreign currency on an annual basis. The reform in the areas of administrative and, uh, and uh, bureaucratic areas in Egypt, Egypt is a 7,000 year uh, bureaucratic country. We actually institutionalized and invented bureaucracy. However, we know its uh, remedies more than anyone. 
The current government is working on all those reforms, social and political and economic legislative reforms. Um, it's my privilege to be part of all those efforts, being uh, a member of the revolution. I am privy to uh, committees on the, uh, in the Prime Minister's office, in the Ministry of Interior's office, social welfare and international cooperation. There's um, a lot of efforts currently trying to steer the country in a new direction. We have over 8 million Egyptians abroad sending remittance of $10 billion annually. That was under Mubarak's, Mubarak's regime. Most of those people left the country for a good reason. They never found a venue for them to grow inside. That's why they left the country. Imagine all those people sending back more than just that amount, investing in Egypt. That amount could considerably uh, catapult in a very um, small amount of time. Investing in large-scale businesses and bringing with them foreign direct investments. Education was not a priority previously, as my colleague mentioned. Um, I think there's, uh, I attended a couple of meetings in the planning uh, uh, for uh, 2012 budget. The country is re and redirecting its allocations to education. We believe that education is Egypt's only salvation. And innovation was not, uh, there was definitely an issue of lack of innovation and creativity, but that's how it seemed. The fact is that there, was, there were no outlets for the creativity of and innovation of Egyptians. That's why it found its way elsewhere. And people like Ahmed Zawil, Nobel Prize uh, winner a couple of years ago, or actually less than a decade ago, Egyptian who worked at Caltech for two decades and more. People like him are redirecting their efforts to Egypt. We have legislative reforms on the way to provide freedoms, the civil liberties. Previously, to register a party, it took around a year and the approval of the security apparatus. Now, the civil rights and civil liberties uh, motion, which is uh, being discussed right now, will grant parties the right to form uh, without any prior approval, just announcing its formation. This is a major step forward, and I think We've already seen a lot of strife. Yes, because change is painful. It's inevitable. And yes, there are many institutions that were not there for democracy to take place. But we are rebuilding them. I want to challenge the, the, the issue of democracy itself, or the concept of democracy. Democracy is perceived more or less in our part of the world as a Western dogma that has found its way in the democratic practices and institutions in the West. Democracy has, is a very uh, highly controversial commodity in our part of the world. However, there are experiences that we can draw upon from our own cultures. Finally, uh, I want to say that Egyptians and Arabs know the ways to their Tahrir squares all over their uh, hometowns and cities. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Our next speaker for the motion is Norman Stone, Professor of International Relations at uh, uh, Bill Kent University in Ankara in Turkey. Before that, uh, Norman Stone was Professor of Modern History at uh, Oxford University from 1984 until 1997. Professor Stone, the floor is yours. Thank you. <coughs> Now, I live a lot of the time in Turkey and have observed what's been going on in areas, after all, of what I might describe as our empire uh, with a great deal of interest. In fact, by chance, happened to be in Egypt when the whole thing blew up. Um, I've been listening to the arguments about democracy and, of course, anybody would want democracy to spread in that part of the world. I have to say Turkey's been a great success. 
but uh, at least relatively speaking. Um, but let's uh, let's put it in perspective. Turkey went through a catastrophe between 1911, when the Italians invaded Libya, and 1923, when the treaty was signed at Lausanne. She lost about a third of her population. So there was a clean slate with which to start. She had seven million refugees who needed to be brought in. And she took, let's say, 80 years over creating the present stable, relatively stable, relatively prosperous arrangements. The Middle East doesn't have that. There is one area in Turkey which does look like the present Middle East, and it's the Kurdish areas or Eastern Turkey. You go to Diyarbakir, you see that central problem, endless children hanging like bunches of grapes, 40 people living off one wage. Now I submit to you, you can't just wander into that sort of place and say, we're going to have democracy now and you'll get prosperity tomorrow. You remember somewhere in Dostoevsky's prophetic book, The Devils, one, the, one of them says to the other, when is, um, when is the kingdom of heaven going to happen? In June. That is the trouble with this easy attitude to progress, which is, I'm, I'm afraid to say, terribly American. You know, the Americans don't really believe in yesterday um, and have too much belief in tomorrow. <laughs> it all vaguely reminds me, I may say, of the something in Europe. The head of BP came to Ankara, Arab specialist, remarkable man. He said, "What's this Arab? What do these revolutions remind you of?" And I said, "It's like 1848," and it is. In 1848, revolutions broke out, one after another, within days of each other. Uh, in, starting in Paris, and then going on to Budapest, <coughs> Berlin, Baden, Milan. Um, and do you know what carried them? The new technology of the time. And what was the new technology of the time? The railway. News travelled very quickly. So, for instance, Wagner could get in touch with Bakunin and say, let's do a revolutionary opera. And they said, we'll make it blasphe a, a, bla a blaspheming opera about Jesus Christ. And Wagner and Bakunin were all set to write Jesus Christ Superstar. And then Wagner grew up. Now these revolutions start off, liberty and the barricades, all the usual Delacroix nonsense. And then what happens within three months? Somebody takes a pot shot at the wife of the governor of Prague. The armies crush them. There's a great deal of instability for two years, which goes on, and then some regimes much more horrible than the ones that had been overthrown come in. And that's the problem with this kind of revolution. It starts off very well. There are, there's nothing really behind it except lots of talk, lots and lots and lots of educated young feeling frustrated, in fact, even hating the present order, and not having the perspective to see what is coming out of all this. The poor old Tunisians were not doing too badly at all. I think Egypt, as we've just heard, was making pretty decent progress, given the appalling circumstances, the overpopulation, the creaking infrastructure of Cairo. <coughs> All of these, all these things must be a nightmare to deal with. And if you throw into it revolution, then I'm afraid you're just going to get out of it something rather worse. And it's been so with, as, uh, as Nora said, it's been so with pretty well every revolution except maybe the American one. And which uh, makes me think that this is a moment very much for caution. Don't expect miracles. There will be corruption but it will not be deadly corruption. You can live with it. Uh, Italy, after all, has lived with corruption since, 19, since 1945, or since 945, or since 945 BC. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's not the end of the world, and to make a revolution over things like that is, I think, with great regret, a, ter a, a, a terrible shame. Play a long game. Thank you.
Professor Norman Stone, thank you very much indeed. Right, let's move on now with the second voice um, against the motion, Roger Cohen, columnist uh, for the New York Times and the International Herald Tribune, reported from Tahrir Square uh, earlier this year and has been in the Middle East for an, 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 a great deal of your career, Roger. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, is uh, yours, and uh, the time is yours for nine minutes. Well, I guess I am an American because I do believe in tomorrow, especially when the alternative is to go back to the bleak uh, police states uh, that we've seen uh, in these Arab countries for so long. And I'm not sure where Professor Stone has been in the Arab world of late, but when I'm in Cairo or Tunis or even Benghazi, um, it certainly doesn't make me think of the remotest uh, eastern parts uh, of Turkey. Um, well, one phrase that we've already heard tonight should tell you why we can't be dismissive of the cascading revolutions known as the Arab Spring. That phrase is the Arab street. For years, it's been used to express the contempt of the West uh, for the youth thronging the avenues and alleys of Cairo, Tunis, Tripoli, and Damascus. And it's been used in the palaces where those despots lived. And I suggest that we retire the phrase, let's do that tonight. These are the very people on those Arab streets who overcoming bullets and brutality, and not least their own fear, have at last brought change to a frozen Arab world. We've been living, ladies and gentlemen, with an Arab Jurassic Park on the littoral just across the Med. Rulers in place for decades turned their countries into personal fiefdoms they enriched themselves and their offspring, groomed to succeed them as if by divine right. The despot's kids trained for high office by listening to Beyonce in private concerts on Caribbean islands, trashing five-star hotels in London and Zurich, doing sweetheart property deals, pocketing all the profits from the mobile phone companies handed to them by the dad dads, and generally behaving with all the decorum of Dominique Strauss-Kahn. <laughs> All this flagrant abuse was justified in the name of a tired binary thinking in London and Washington of the same kind as we see from our opponents tonight. Its core is that the only alternative, the only alternative to jihadist mayhem in the Middle East is the repression, often savage repression, of the Western back dictators once practiced in Cairo and still today, lamentably, in Damascus. In fact, in my view, the contrary is true. The brutality of the Arab dinosaurs fed the very condition the West has sought to reverse. When the only legal place of assembly is the mosque, Islamist radicalization becomes more likely. When the individual is crushed, the temptation to subsume personality into fanatical movements grows. When rule is arbitrary and used for the benefit of those small coteries I just described, rage grows among the dis disenfranchised. I'd say the best antidote to 9-11 is in fact 2-11, the date Mubarak fell. I was in Sidi Bouzid, a little slice of Tunisian nowhere, where the Arab awakening began with a tiff over a fruit and vegetable cart. I was in Tahrir Square for two weeks. I was in Benghazi, where lightly armed rebels battle Gaddafi's delusional abuse. And I'll tell you the phrase that I heard most from the youth that we debate tonight. It was, this is the first time, this is the first time that I feel my life is worth anything. The first time I feel that my actions can actually make a difference. Young Arabs are discovering what it is to become agents of their own lives with the capacity to change things rather than live in a world of conspiracy theories. They are leaving behind their captive minds. Think of that vegetable card and Mohamed Bouazizi's self-immolation. What this man could stand no longer was the humiliation of living under arbitrary diktat that left him penniless. Such sentiments lie at the heart of this whole Arab awakening, from the Gulf to Syria to Libya to Tunisia. And yet our opponents tonight are trying to persuade you that no, it's hopeless. These people living just a few hundred miles from Europe cannot aspire to a decent society, as if there was something in the Arab genome that condemned the peoples from North Africa to the Gulf to misery, abuse, and violence. 
They will say, as Professor Stone just did, that this is realism based on grim history. Maybe even that it's realism based on the need for oil. In fact, it's not realism, but pessimism and cynicism spiced with a dose of the old contempt. Uh, Noura complains that there's a lot of dissent in Egypt, that there's no agreement on things, that there's an irresponsible media. Well, look around at the United States. Look around, <laughs> at, look around at this country. Well, welcome to democracy, Nora. Uh, is the answer to solving those problems going back to the former despotism? Is that how a democratic culture is going to evolve? No. Let this play out. Shine a light. Let's get these societies evolving and moving. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no going back. Having broken through fear, having understood and put to use the power of Facebook and Twitter, having grasped how powerful the connective tissue of social media can be, these people will not return to those Jurassic parks I mentioned. Will the processes be tidy and uniform? No. Will there be quick fixes? No. Will there be brutality as in Syria and Libya and disappointments? Yes, there will be. On the 10th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, I was in Berlin, and one of the leaders of the East German democracy movement said 10 years on, we dreamed of paradise, and we woke up in North Rhine-Westphalia. <laughs> no, so it goes in the aftermath of the adrenaline rush of revolution. But what I've seen of the idealism and bravery of the inspiring youths of these liberated Arab states or half-states, I am convinced that gradually they will move forward. Revolutions that introduce freedom and representative governments to societies that were brutal little to personality cults are the start of generational undertakings. Habits of initiative have to be learned. Institutions have to be built. Give and take has to be learned. Civilized dissent accepted. This takes time. These countries will need the West's support, political and financial. More open societies have to be seen to deliver jobs. There is a strong strategic case, even in the cash-strapped West and Europe, for a large-scale effort to invest in and assist these new societies. It should not be impossible to marry Western know-how and capital with the talents of millions of young Arabs, starved until now of possibility. And Ahmed did a great job of describing the distortions in these societies that prevented a more generalized progress and left the money there was in the hands of what's called in Egypt often the privileged 3%. In Tunis, I met an American-trained entrepreneur who just returned from California to start a solar power company. Energy and food are just beginning. The possibilities are endless. Egypt, as you know, is the world's oldest nation state, and this is the pivot of the whole Arab Spring. It's enjoyed 40 years of peace. That's very significant. There are no raw scars. It's relatively homogeneous, although recent clashes between Muslims and Christians are worrying. It has a large middle class. It has a professional army that showed great restraint through the Tahrir Square uprising. Don't tell me that these are not substantial building blocks for a freer, more successful society than Mubarak's long night, one that will eventually fulfill the aspirations of e Egypt's youth. People ask of the Libyan rebels, who are they? Well, on the basis of my week in Benghazi this month, they're led by professionals, lawyers, business people, academics, and their rank and file want above all to be free. After 42 years of Gaddafi, that's a legitimate aspiration and a very concrete one, freedom. I was in the liberated half of Libya when bin Laden was killed. Nobody, ladies and gentlemen, gave a damn. These are not Salafists. They want an end to despotism, not its reinvention in Islamic form. They want the future, not a return to the caliphate. They want accountability, not virgins in heaven. Which brings us to the big canard, one to which our opponents have succumbed. This Arab Spring is not Tehran 1979, let alone 1848. It's not a brief season of hope condemned to lurch into, into repression. We live in a different world today of interconnectedness, social media, and growing openness and the times for these societies to live in anachronistic prisons so close to Europe is over. Thank you. Roger Cohen, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I should say that as this is being uh, webcast live, 
and you did mention Dominique Strauss-Kahn. <laughs> he does deny the charges, uh, even though he's been denied bail um, in a New York court in the last couple of hours. So I, I think show, I'm suggesting he might have shown a possible lack of decorum, not that he committed a crime. I'm merely saying there's balance as well, which I feel I should put in uh, as this is being broadcast live. Right, the last speaker for the motion, Douglas Murray, author and journalist and associate director of the Henry Jackson Society. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, well, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you uh, to our hosts here tonight. Um, if I can open on a... Uh, spirit of boring bipartisanship, I want to agree with a lot of what our opponents here tonight have said, um, particularly what Roger Cohen just said now. Um, I, I certainly speak for myself, and I think speaking for our side in this debate tonight, certainly feel nothing like contempt for the people who have risen up against their governments in this historic last few months. Far from it. Uh, far from it. Uh, we certainly don't say that they cannot aspire uh, to a better life. We hope they can. We encourage them to. So that, those straw men, if I may say so, don't please fall for. But secondly, I wanted to say that I also agree with Ahmed when he said what the problems are in the societies that we're talking about, not just Egypt, but in each of the societies which we'll talk about tonight. Uh, they have... I reckon myself, two primary problems. One, uh, the terrific lack of democratic accountability across the region. And two, the terrible uh, possession uh, by a tiny elite of the vast proportion of the wealth of those nations. The, as Ahmed said, the utterly inequitable distribution of wealth. Uh, any of these countries, as you well know, when you go around any of the countries in the region, you see this with your own eyes. Anyone can see it. A tourist can see it. Uh, somebody with no knowledge of the region can see it. The fact that youth, the best hopes of a prosperous future for a country, stand around on street corners with nothing to do, with no jobs, with no future, um, hawking around for tiny amounts of money, when they could be the future of their country, and they should be the future of their country. So let's not start with the idea that this is about us saying those people shouldn't have the life we believe they should. But it is very complex and very difficult and very worrying uh, what is happening and what will happen in the future. So we're not arguing a case of pessimism, but one for caution. You know, uh, Milan uh, Kundera said in Testaments Betrayed that a man stumbles along a path in his life and woman, may I add, just in case anyone wants to try to pick me up on that one, uh, that we walk uh, along a path in life where we're surrounded by fog and we stumble along and we find a way. Uh, this isn't the interesting observation. The interesting observation is this, I think. Kundera says that when man looks back, he sees the man, he sees the path, but he doesn't see the fog. Everything afterwards looks like it was meant to happen. Uh, everything looks like it was inevitable. The Whig interpretations take over. Um, but as we're stumbling along this path, as North Africa and the Middle East stumbles along this path at the moment, it is very hard uh, to see and to predict with any certainty uh, the course of events. But I wanted to make, for our side, a couple of points which I think, as I say, should urge you to some degree of caution. The first, I would argue, is this. There are some patterns emerging. This is very early, but some patterns emerging. One of the most troubling to me is the following, that in the region, if you survey the governments, those who have fallen, those who are at threat, those who seem to be under no threat at all, by and large, it is now possible to say that the slightly better or less worst governments have been most vulnerable to these revolutions and the most bloodied, the most bloodthirsty, the most intransigent seem to be under no risk at all. What I mean by that is that the government of Tunisia, one of the less bad governments in the region, certainly I'm not going to argue it's good, don't, uh, don't mistake me for a moment, but by and large those governments who are not willing uh, and have not been willing to send 
their troops out and gunned down as many people as possible, have gone. And those who are willing to be the most bloodthirsty are staying. Saudi was meant to have a day of rage. But of course, all the people who were going to partake in it disappeared into prisons, uh, arrested, and so on. So it didn't happen. In Iran, we know the regime there, which has the blood of so, ma so many students and others on their hands, is willing again and again to gun down those people. So it is likely it will stay at the moment. I think this is, I flag up first, a very bad, very negative lesson of these last few months, and one we must hope doesn't continue. But it is a pattern that is emerging and should trouble us. The second issue is, those of us who feel only admiration for this historic set of events, only admiration for the people who have made history by, for the first time in the region, changing governments, not by military coup, but by a bottom-up revolution against those governments, there is reason to be, have great concern for their hopes and their future. What happens to revolutionaries after the revolution? We all know from history that the revolutionaries tend not to survive the revolution. And the bodies of liberals lay over the barbed wire as others walk over them to the future they would like. And there are some signs that that will happen in the region. Now, certainly, if I were a young Egyptian in Tahrir Square, I would feel that my hopes for my country's future had by no means been answered so far when we still have the military in control of the country, when we still see that. So yes, one would like to be optimistic. I would love to be as optimistic as anyone about this. But I think we have to have an element of caution. Thirdly, you can generally judge societies and the patterns that are going to emerge from them by the way in which they treat minorities, by the way that those who are not the leading class, racial, religious group, whatever, in the country are treated. And there are already, again, very troubling signs of this. In Tunisia, in February, only days after the overthrow of the government, uh, Islamists uh, tore into the old quarter in Tunis and shut down those shops that they believed uh, were haram. There was, of course, the murder of a Polish Catholic priest. I think I can be safe in saying the first sectarian murder of that kind in modern Tunisian history. And for the first time in modern history in Tunisia, a country with no history of uh, anti-Semitism in recent decades, anti-Semitic slogans started to be chanted for the first time outside the local synagogue. We know, we all know, we've all seen what's been happening in recent weeks with the treatment of Copts in Egypt. And it would be a very unwise thing to watch the emerging pact between Salafi elements and the Brotherhood in Egypt with anything other than a feeling of concern and caution. That's a little of what I think is happening in the region. But I wanted to highlight one other thing, which is what is happening in the West about this. Because I believe that Western democracies, free societies of any kind, have a duty to help those people who also seek freedom, who seek democracy, who seek to overthrow governments which would behave in the way that governments across the Middle East have behaved for decades. But there is terrible concern about this even. Gaddafi, it couldn't, be hard, it couldn't be easier to find an outspoken, intransigent enemy of the West and now somebody who has been massacring, yet again, his own people. And the best that the democracies can do is to have a no-fly zone and say that the only thing worth doing, i.e. the toppling of Gaddafi, the killing even of Gaddafi is the one thing they won't do. We then see in recent days, one minute, in recent days, Hillary Clinton saying that Assad is still able to be a reformer. As his troops gun down the Syrian people, she says it's possible he could still be the key. We see David Cameron walking around Tahrir Square and then going straight to Saudi and speaking to the Saudi Minister of Defense who's just been pimping his troops out to the Bahrain government to shoot the people of Bahrain. You know, there is no, there is no will in, in the free democracies to help. And this is why I think that the case that our side, and certainly I am arguing tonight, is not that we should be pessimistic, but that we should be very cautious, wish our friends very, very much hope, and wish them well, 
but to warn them of what could happen and to pray they don't go down those paths. Thank you. Douglas, thank you very much indeed. So we've heard all three voices for the motion. Now the uh, last voice uh, against the motion. Uh, Fawaz Jejez, who is Professor of Middle Eastern Politics and International Relations at the London School of Economics. He also holds the Emirates Chair of the Contemporary Middle East. Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, just one point of correction for our opponent. We're discussing the Arab revolutions uh, we're not discussing Iran. Iran is not an Arab country, just a, 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 sim a, simple, a simple fundamental point about the difference between us and our opponents about history. Uh, let me start by relaying a story about Egypt and the military council, and you all know the story, of the height of the revolutionary uh, uh, moment in Egypt. The big question on the table for the military council and the United States was how to find a dignified exit for President Mubarak and his family. Dignified exit. And the consensus was, well, we must basically preserve the legacy of Mubarak. He served his country for almost, well, you know, 30, 40 years. He branded himself as a military hero in the 1973 war. And the consensus was that basically Mubarak must go to his favorite villa in Sharm el-Sheikh, along with his family. And the military, the senior echelon of the military, provided assurances that against prosecution for Mubarak and his family. That was, I mean, the, the senior echelon of the military. Millions of Egyptians, millions of young Egyptians, of old Egyptians, men and women, Christians and Muslims, secular and pious, protested, went on the streets and defied the military, the senior echelons of the army, Mubarak allies. And guess where's Mubarak today? President Hosni Mubarak, his wife, Suzanne Mubarak, his two children, Gamal and Ala, are either in prison or basically under house arrest, waiting to be prosecuted, brought to justice on corruption charges. We don't know the extent of it, billions, two, three billions, or 40 billions, and of course, on charges of basically killing uh, civilian protesters. Why do I tell you this particular story? What are the big lessons to take from this particular story? And this is for our opponent. The first lesson is that this is a revolution in the making. This is the beginning as opposed to the end of the story. The great Arab awakening, the powerful storm, basically has shaken the very foundation of the Arab order, the very foundation of the uh, Arab order. I would argue far from being a spent force, as some of our opponents have argued, in fact, it's still potent. And in fact, the drivers behind this particular storm are millions, millions of Arabs in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Syria, in Yemen, in Libya, in Bahrain, in Oman, in other uh, places. And the lesson of the story I mentioned about Egypt even the most powerful military institution in the Arab world could not ignore, could not ignore the changed political landscape in Egypt, could not ignore the demands of millions of Egyptians. They basically accepted the demands and now Mubarak and his family are awaiting trial. And I do hope they receive a just trial, not just a revolutionary trial along the lines of the 1950s and 1960s and 70s and 80s and 90s. This leads me to a related uh, uh, second point. Despite all the challenges, our opponents are absolutely correct. Who is suggesting there are no challenges? The challenges are great, tremendous. But despite all the uh, challenges, I would argue, I would argue our side is that the transition to open and pluralistic societies, the most important ele element is what I call the change psychological mood of the Arab population. Arabs today at this particular moment feel empowered, emboldened. This changing psychology really has changed the entire political and social landscape in the region. I would argue a rupture has taken place in the Middle East. As my colleague Roger Cohen mentioned, there is no return because this psychological rupture basically goes 
really to the very heart of this particular region. And this psychological rupture has not just basically uh, removed the barrier fear, it has shattered what we call political apathy. Political apathy in the Arab world was as important as the wall of fear, because well, what? It allowed autocrats and demagogues and extremists to speak in the names of millions uh, of Arabs. And I would argue, despite all the challenges, political empowerment and activism are the most effective means, the most effective means basically to prevent the hijacking of the Arab revolutions by extremists, as our opponent mentioned, and also the most effective means against counter-revolutions by some of the senior military, um, uh, the echelons, senior echelons of the military in the Arab world. And in fact, you cannot understand really what's happening in the Arab world as a historian of the Arab world and the modern Middle East without understanding that this is a significant moment. It's a moment of self-determination, a moment of self-determination. The first time, almost in 600 years, the first time, Professor Norman Stone, in 600 years, that Arabs feel empowered, they feel that they want to own their history and determine their own uh, future. Well, I mean 600 years from the Ottoman Empire to the colonial moment to the post-colonial states, Arab civil, uh, citizens were not really given a chance and opportunity to determine uh, their own future. Truly, I have never seen, I had never seen Arabs as empowered as they are today. And driven what? They're driven by universal values. They're not driven by Salafi desires. They're not driven to establish Quranic uh, uh, states. What are the big slogans in the Arab world today, uh, our opponents? They are for elections, open societies, separations of power, and basically peaceful transition to uh, power. These are universal values that have been internalized by millions of Arabs and Muslims. The reason why I'm suggesting, why I'm stressing this particular point, because again, as my colleague uh, 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 Roger mentioned earlier, for 60 years, for 60 years, think of what the dominant narrative about the Arab world was. Arabs and Muslims and Islam were incompatible with democracy. Arabs, Islam, and Muslims were incompatible uh, uh, with democracy. And this particular traditionalist narrative basically gained powerful allies in some of the most powerful academic and policy circles in the West. In some of the most power, and, and you hear some of the echoes of this particular narrative. Think of how the Middle East was portrayed in the West. You had Islamists, religiously based activists, and you had autocrats. There was nothing in between. You had a huge vacuum. Where's the third alternative in the last seven months we have seen? The third alternative, the millions of voiceless Arabs who regain their voices, those are the biggest constituency in the Arab world. The Islamists are important. The Islamists are important. They, they are just only one, one basically element in a mosaic of social and political forces. And let's keep in mind, even if the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt was to gain a majority in the parliament, Islamists have come a long way. They have traveled a long journey. They have a longer journey to travel, of course, but Islamists basically are not a monolith. The Muslim Brotherhood is not, is not Al-Qaeda. And the reality is, at the end of the day, they are part and parcel of the social fabric. Don't fall for scary tactics. Well, of course, our opponents have made the case for us. We're not saying that the Arab revolutions will be basically translated into democracy tomorrow. Professor Norman Stone talked about Turkey. It has taken Turkey almost eight decades and still transitioning to democracy. Of course, you have to start somewhere, an institutional building. Uh, we know how long it takes, time, energy, and resources, but we have uh, to start somewhere. And the reality is, the reality is, for the last 60 years, I mentioned the so-called the Arab exceptionalism, that Arabs and Islam were incompatible with democracy. The echoes, of what you heard tonight is that there is also another exceptionalism. Arabs and Muslims cannot overcome the great challenges that basically uh, 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 exist in their societies. In fact, I would argue, I would argue our case is that the changing psychological 
uh, uh, landscape in the Arab world basically is the most effective guarantee to basically uh, 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 help Arab and Muslim societies weather this particular storm and of course over uh, the long time. Finally, the final one minute, the final point I, I want, absolutely the final point I want to make is that our opponents inst instead of belittling the great aspirations, the great universal aspiration, and basically underestimating the great struggle against, I mean, great odds by, Arab, by Arabs and Muslims, I would argue we in the West, as Western society, the least we can do, the least we can do is to basically fully embrace the hopes and the aspirations of millions of Arabs and Muslims and offer only, only moral support. I urge you to basically offer moral support for the millions of Arabs and Muslims who are struggling to be free. Yeah. Thank you. Right, uh, mobilize the microphones because we'll have about 25 minutes to hear your views. And I don't want long speeches. I want to hear from as many of you uh, as possible. But before we get to that stage, I'll tell you how you voted uh, as you were coming in. For the motion, 46. Against the motion, 75. Don't knows, 55. So a number of you still have to make up your mind. And hopefully, the six uh, interventions we've already heard will have helped you make up your mind. We will hear from each of the panelists for a maximum of two minutes before we finish uh, at 8 o'clock. But let's hear as many voices as possible from you in the audience. And uh, up here, uh, they can respond as they choose. Please, over there, and get a microphone to somebody else as well, please. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you for a very stimulating debate. Um, my question is for the opposition to the uh, motion. Um, my understanding of the motion is that, uh, is that democracy will not provide the economic dividends the youth are seeking. Um, I think everyone in the room would uh, see the benefit of the political freedoms that will come out of, of the, uh, the Arab Spring. Um, in, in terms of what uh, Ahmed said, um, I, I thought that, that a lot of what you said was quite speculative in terms of the, economy, the future economy in Egypt. Um, and uh, in terms of what Rod Roger said, I thought that um, what you said was, was, was very good. But again, you had a very long-term perspective on things uh, in terms of that it will take time to build up infrastructure for businesses and free enterprise and things like that in Egypt. Um, is that going to satisfy the youth now? Um, right. Stack that up for the moment, can you, uh, those on this side of the house. Who's got the microphone here? And move that microphone somewhere else, please. Um, yes, yeah, so I've got a question for the proposition for the motion. Um, you mentioned examples of Turkey when you were talking about revolutions. You also mentioned 1848, the American Revolution, the French Revolution. I was wondering why you didn't discuss the most recent, recent revolution and transition to democracy in a Muslim country, which would be in Indonesia in 1998, where we have seen in the past 12 to 13 years a strong democratic institution being built and strong performance in the economy in the post Saharto era also a situation very similar to Egypt with large degrees of official corruption and misuse of resources. Right, let me put that question to those speaking for the motion. Norman Stone. Well, I, I didn't mention uh, Indonesia because you know if you'll forgive me, I don't know anything about it. Uh, and uh, um, I take your point entirely about that, that, that there, there, it is comparable. But, it, you know, don't forget there is the problem in Indonesia of the Chinese minority, which complicates things all over the place, doesn't it? With, um, and, and that is something which you haven't got in Egypt, which is, as we were saying, more homogeneous. Laura, do you want to come in <clears throat> on that? No. Okay. I, I just wanted to clear, if I may, if I was, uh, seemed to imply, well, no, he did imply, he said, <laughs> that uh, our side weren't aware that Iranians aren't Arabs. I just wanted to clear out that straw man, which is that we are aware of that. But, um, but and that, I just that wanted to end on that and on the issue here. Um, I, would just, I would just make the following point, is that uh, no two revolutions are ever the same, and they're very rarely even that alike. Uh, as they say, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And there are echoes one can hear. I don't think Indonesia, the, the example of Indonesia and the problems that Indonesian society has got over 
in the last decade or more are the same as those that the, the, that the Middle East is facing, the same economic reasons, and particularly this issue not just of political corruption, but of political parties that have lain dormant in some cases or have been uh, n more than uh, dormant and uh, have a chance now to make their voice heard in a way which I think is more troubling than the situation was there. Now that uh, rather critical question uh, to those against the motion, mm. particularly, OK, politics is one thing. What about the economic potential? Well, I would just say we don't know how fast uh, the economic benefits are going to come to these countries. What we do know is that these completely distorted systems in which billions showed up in Swiss bank accounts. I was talking to a businessman in Benghazi whose father owned quite a big construction company, expropriated overnight uh, by Gaddafi, no compensation whatsoever. Essentially, systems where one person's whim, zero transparency, zero accountability, uh, benefiting families and small coterie, that is no basis to build economies that can satisfy uh, the aspirations and demands of very young societies. In principle, you know, why shouldn't these societies work much better on the economic front once changes are in place and we get more of a rule of law, more transparency, more accountability? They're not far from Europe, and there are all kinds of sectors in which you could see significant development. So I think lay the basis, and you'll begin to see progress. Ahmed, you come from Egypt. Yes. <clears throat> uh, there's nothing speculative about 3.5 billion US dollars coming through Suez Canal every year redirected. That's already happening. And I'm telling you from within side, um, it's, a, it's a privilege that I'm currently seeing all of those legislative changes. Um, when we have a civil uh, movement that will gain momentum, it will become a watchdog over the government's expenditure and how they you know, reallocate and redirect those uh, resources. So the, the, the change is happening. It's not on its way. It is happening. And it's, it's very different because Egyptians for so long took flight with the uh, investments abroad and never came back. Now it's different. The only the remittance was just to keep the family surviving, but now they have a vested interest to reinvest in the country. Right. How many people would like to ask questions? So I've got to I I get a sense. Fawaz, yes, and I can see about 10 or 12 hands, so we can work out the mathematics. It's going to get tight. Fawaz. You know, the reason, thank you for the question about economics. We didn't have the time to go into specifics, but let me myself address the question of economics. I mean, I know most of you would be surprised if I say there are no economies in the Arab world. There are neither capitalist economies nor socialist economies. You don't have uh, rational economies in the way we define economies. You have crony cap uh, economies, that is a relationship between a very small power elite and basically the small business elite, uh, basically the parasite. And that's why money is not really basically, if you are an entrepreneur, if you are in Egypt like Ahmed, you can go to the bank and get a loan and establish business because the money is recycled between the power elite on the one hand and the small business community on the other hand. Let me say that economically you have to lay out the institutions. You have first to put, there are no institutions. Egypt is one of them, Egypt, the most pivotal Arab country, is a broken country. I mean, Professor Norman Stone talk, talks, talked about poverty in Egypt. 43.9% of the 84 million Egyptians no poverty, either no. in poverty or below the poverty line. Uh, institutions don't work at all. So not only you have corruption, again, the Arab countries, whether Iraq or Egypt or Yemen, the highest in terms of corruption. Uh, take Egypt, the, the tourism uh, sector itself. I mean, this particular sector attracts between 10 and 20 million people. You can basically transform the institution into 100 million people. Egypt, one of the, I mean, again, I don't... Two-thirds of the world's heritage. So, again, once you lay out the institutions, when, once you have transparency, once you have accountability, once you have a, a rational decision-making process, I would argue it's going to take some while, but the spillover effect would be tremendous. For us, thank you. Egypt. All right, let me ask you to be as brief as you can, then I can get as many voices as possible. Who's got the microphone there and here? Please, who's got it? Speak. Yeah, um, good afternoon to you all. My name is um, Abdijata. I'm from the Gambia, West Africa. Um, I would like to um, add my boss, um, voice um, to um, my colleagues there who are um, supporting um, the motions. I believe that um, all of us um, should um, support um, the process and um, what is happening um, in Egypt, you know, to make sure that um, there is peace in the Middle East, not only Egypt. And also, um, another thing that I wanted to um, re-emphasize on, um, there are um, speakers there whom you know that they say that um, the Western influence and also um, the international pressure. We believe that um, they are giving that support. But at the end of the day, 
if you look at it, at times, you know, the way um, the Western world and also even um, the international community, they help um, in the Middle East process. At times, you could see that um, they are not being um, factual, you know. You could see that at times they will go and then they wanted to help. At the same time, they would, would like to um, maneuver. And also, we are talking about Do you corruption. have a question, please? Yeah. We are talking about um, corruption. You know, we believe that um, corruption is the order of the day. It's everywhere, be it in the Middle East, Africa, or even Europe, you know, the world in general. So um, my question here is that um, how can we ensure, as part of um, the human family, to ensure that um, there is lasting peace um, in the Middle East? That's my question. Thank you. Uh, over here, please pass that microphone on somewhere else, please. A question to the opposition. Um, I think dem democracy has more than one facet. And while the psychological change appears to have occurred, do you think that there are parties with the capability or that there will in, in recent future, foreseeable future, be parties with the capability to d govern in a de democratic way, to manage the economy, do this massive task, that um, building this democracy from scratch and parties that will have the ability to govern without themselves being corrupted by power. Do you think this will occur not within the ten, um, eight, genera eight decades sorry, or um, after several revolutions, but do you think within this revolution a government will emerge? A party right, we got emerge? the message. Yeah. Okay, fine. We're going to stack up two or three of these <laughs> questions. Who's got the microphone now here, please? Um, thank you, Nick. Thank you, um, everyone. But thank you most, the opposition to this wretched motion, for really giving the world that one commodity. Why do you call it wretched? <laughs> because it is a wretched motion, sir. We need to vote this motion down. I don't have a question for you. I just urge you all to vote against this <laughs> right. motion. Okay. Because, because you give us hope. And, of course, you can look backward. You can look at our revolution, followed by the Restoration. You can look at the French Revolution, followed by the Terror. But this is different because this is a youth-driven revolution. And the only one that I remember is the, against the Vietnam War. And, oh, God, first they killed Martin Luther King, then they killed Bobby Kennedy, then, God help us, they elected Nixon. But still we carried on, and right, we won okay. in the end. So vote this wretched motion down. Thank you. We're talking about... C can, I, can I encourage, I know particularly through the British Council, there are a number of you who come from the region. I'd like to hear your voices as well uh, in this debate. Who is here from the region, please? Um, and I'm not going to forget the others, but uh, as you can see, time is short. Please my go name ahead. is Loe, and I'm from uh, Yemen. Uh, my question is, um, how will the result of uh, revolutions will change in different countries? I mean, um, the revolution went different in, in Libya and Yemen than it went in, in Egypt. And uh, yeah, so and I mean that it went different for in, uh, in Tunisia and Egypt. And in Libya and uh, Yemen, it went totally different. And uh, the, resu the, the results will def definitely be different. So I would like to, to demonstrate right. the difference. All right, let's pause at that point. Would you like to pick up whichever questions uh, you feel are relevant uh, to, to you? Nora. The military had a role in actually making the revolution succeed or, um, or, or the revolution bringing down the politicians. In Libya and Yemen, it's, uh, it's different because the military has a different uh, stance towards the people. That's why the revolutions, uh, they, they cannot be actually compared to each other because uh, there are different dynamics in each country. Each country has its own case. However, there are similar uh, similar causes of the revolution, going from the frustration of the youth wanting freedom, dignity, uh, justice to be put in perspective. And your view about parties as well, about how they're going to develop in Egypt? Well, the, the thing is that I commented on the parties in Egypt, uh, they still lack the political culture of dialogue, and uh, this is something of a concern. That's why I was for the motion. Uh, the, there is a need to accommodate to pluralism. And uh, it depends on, uh, on the extent that these parties need to realize this as soon as possible. Right, pick up on the points which are relevant to you. Um, Roger. Well, on the parties question, which is a very good and important question, uh, yeah, the nature of these societies means that you really don't know what's going on underneath. In Franco Spain, nobody had heard of Felipe Gonzalez. The personality cult in Libya was such that I was told when I was in Benghazi, you weren't even allowed to name football players, soccer players, you would have player number eight plus passes to number four who dribbles past number seven and shoots because no other name, no other person 
could emerge uh, in any form. And so you're dealing with, in Libya, with a kind of tabula rasa. In Egypt, there are some institutions. My feeling is certainly in Egypt, it'll be longer in Libya, is that you will get uh, parties over the next year uh, establishing themselves. And there's no reason to think um, that they won't be able to govern effectively. Fawaz, do you want to come in particularly on this issue about what common threads there are across the revolutions, which we're loosely calling the Jasmine Revolution, but it's broader than North Africa, it's the Middle East as well. We've got six or seven of them going on at the moment. You're absolutely correct. Just one point about Egypt, just for some of you. Uh, how many of you know that Egypt in the 1920s, 30s, and, and 40s had one of the most progressive constitutions in the world? Egypt basically had as progressive a constitution as the United States of America. It was in the 1940s, at the end of uh, uh, World War II, in particular the Palestine War, the corruption that basically uh, permeated all Egyptian life that really brought about a major transformation. So the Egyptians have a model to go back to. The 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, the constitution was there. One final point about really minor point about corruption. Corruption, when we talk about corruption, it's not just about the Mubarak family or the Assad family or the Ali Abdullah Saleh. Corruption in the Arab world is systemic. It's a system. It permeates all aspects of life. And that's why it's, the entire system itself is rotten. And that's why in particular, this particular huge gap between the wealthy, the rich, and the poor, the abject poverty and the decadent wealth, and given the uh, uh, nature of the corruption, which really brought about, I mean, this particular uh, wave of, uh, uh, of Arab revolutions. I would argue that corruption really lay at the heart of this particular uh, Arab awakening, uh, in particular the abject poverty, in particular also uh, what we need to, to understand about the Arab world is that uh, here you have, uh, I mean, technology, the new media, as you all know in the 1970s, 1980s, and early 1990s, the governments were able to control the flow of information. In the 1990s, with the advent of Al Jazeera, Al Arabiya, and the advent, of course, of the CNN effect and the, uh, uh, all the internet, really it changed the, 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 the strategic landscape uh, in the region uh, in the sense that the government no longer controlled the flow of information. That is, uh, what happens in Egypt, Al Jazeera brought what happened in Egypt to every household in Egypt. Al Jazeera brought what happened inside Yemen to every household uh, in Yemen itself. So I would argue <clears throat> abject poverty, uh, uh, a closed political and oppressive political system, uh, the new media, and in particular the internet and Al Jazeera effect uh, played a key role in the uh, uh, wave that basically uh, has wrapped the Arab world. And quickly, among all six of you, is there one model or are we seeing very specific, very different models right across North Africa and the Middle East? Any of you, quickly. I think Fawaz's mention of universalist values is present everywhere in these uprisings. I mean, these are post-Islamist movements in which people are looking for dignity and expression. The reactions are very different from country to country. You've seen a very, very brutal and ongoing uh, clampdown uh, in Syria. Uh, but I think the, the aspirations are, have a lot in common with each other. All right, Douglas. I just say the reactions are very different and the outcomes are possibly going to be uh, very different as well. I mean, there's a tendency when you look back on any revolution uh, to try to make some coherence out of it, and people even do it when they talk about uh, post-1989. I mean, people still talk about as if every uh, country in the former Eastern Bloc uh, is now exactly the same in its uh, democratic system. And as anyone who knows Eastern Europe uh, here can, can tell you, uh, the, re the differences that are visible now and palpable now from country to country there is still wildly different. Let me hear th two or three more voices, if I may, from the region. Uh, I saw three of Could you, who's from the region, please, here at the front and at the back? Um, your voices, if you could move the here first, and then could you go around in the middle, yeah. down at the back, please? Yeah. Yes. Oh, oh hello. Um, There's a I, lady at the back. Um, three. You, you okay. go ahead. Okay. Um, one, uh, one topic that I noticed was... Where are you from? Oh, uh, I'm Lebanese-American. Uh, so, yes, I... Are you American or Lebanese? I'm both. <laughs> I'm both. This... Anyway, uh, lest we get distracted on two uh, less important questions, uh, 
I would like to, uh, I would like to mention my, uh, well, I noticed that the topic of woman was conspicuously absent in this debate. And given that no society can advance and develop without full and equal rights to all members of society, not just minorities, not just male members of minorities, but women. I, uh, I was quite disappointed to see okay. this. Um, right. so can, we pick, can we pick that point up? Because I think I know exactly where you're coming from. Yes, I would, I would like uh, the only woman on the panel, Nora, to address this question and to see, and just to see how you think women figure into this revolution, into the discourse of the revolutions, and how they may be present in a post-revolutionary Arab world. Fine, I'm gonna get a lot of lady voices from the audience, please, at the back. Hello, my name is Asma. I'm from Egypt, and uh, my question is for the people speaking for the motion. There seems to be a consensus that democracy in Europe and the US didn't happen overnight, and that revolutions take decades to come to fruition. Um, so why are the panelists looking at the events immediately after the revolution, just two or three months, and um, looking at these events to suggest that these events will not come to fruition in the same way, as if to suggest there's an intrinsic reason why Arabs can't achieve the same gains. So is this what they're suggesting, and why can't Arabs overcome these challenges? Thank, Thank you. you. Please. And one more on this side as well. Who's got the microphone at the back, please? Can you choose between yourselves and speak? Yeah, yeah. Hi. I'm from Egypt as well. Yeah, and my question as well is for people for the, mo for the motion. Actually, when Douglas, I think he mentioned something about the regimes in Syria and, on, and how they treated the revolutions there in Syria and Iran and in Libya. I think the situation is more different a little bit there. They have more strong iron hands than in Egypt, than the governments in Egypt and in Tunisia. But the same thing is that there is a price that ha must be paid for having your freedom. So because it's much more strict there and it's much more harder, this, this is like, the first level of achieving it. Look at these people like in two years when they're having another revolution, if this one didn't even succeed. Thank you. So Who's got the microphone here? Uh, good afternoon. My name is Amin Bouafsoun. Uh, I'm a Tunisian national. Uh, actually, first of all, I would like to comfort uh, my uh, other participants regarding the role of women. Um, actually, the reason why I believe this revolution started in Tunisia is simply because this is where women are mostly empowered in the Arab world. And you can see um, you know, you can, you can judge by history how Tunisian women have been participating in the political life and that will give you uh, enough comfort. Now, my real question is, um, don't you believe, it's actually for the entire panel, don't you believe that in order to achieve economic dividends, the real and the most effective way today in the Arab world is to reinforce existing trade agreements and probably have a more equal uh, share of resources among Arab countries. And I would like to use the example of the recent GCC initiative to invite both the kingdoms of Jordan and Morocco. And in that case, wouldn't the real question be, how can you achieve democratic dividends by using economic growth? Thank you, right. Let's move on with that very critical issue of women. And in fact, the UN Human Development Report for the Arab world back in 2003 said very explicitly, this is going to be a failure unless something is done uh, very urgently, and of course, look at what has not happened, Nora. Uh, well, uh, let us start by commenting that women who seek equality with men lack ambition. We, ask, we are aspiring for more, to be honest. So, uh, the thing is, uh, regarding women, uh, in, in Tahrir Square, for example, uh, it was a model to overcome the, the gender unrest. Uh, there were no reports of harassment, as far as I know. Uh, however, uh, Women need to get more empowered because they, they need to have the culture of participating because we're talking about the majority of the society who was kept away from politics. In order to mobilize women to participate, it's taking a long time indeed, but uh, it is happening. Do you think a watershed has now been crossed with the uh, revolutions and the uprisings or not? Well, I think that... Uh, you mean women? Yes. Well, well, I think that there, there are women who are actually running for presidency, for example. Uh, there is a potential front-runner 
candidate who is aspiring to become the president, and she is preparing for campaign for herself in the upcoming elections. So women are, try, are trying to engage into politics. It, it will take a long time, but it will happen. Um, Fawaz, do you have a view on this? Yes, I think Arab societies have a long way to go uh, in terms of the empowerment of women. There's no doubt about it. They have a long, long way to go. But the reality is Arab women have played a key role in the revolutions in Egypt, in Yemen, in Syria. In fact, ironically, in Syria, now women are a critical mass in trying to challenge the repressive regime uh, in Damascus. Last week, they absolutely, and Yemen in particular, last week, the protest last Friday in Syria was to defend basically what happened to women um, in Syria because many women were arrested and abused by the authorities and thousands of Syrians went on the streets to protest what happened to women. But truly, in the last six, seven months, women have become very proactive, have taken a major role in almost every single Arab country, including Yemen, one of the most conservative countries in the Arab world. Norman Stone, do you um, have any observation on that with your Turkish experience about the way things have changed or not in Turkey, for example? Well, I think the, well, the, the, the vital thing is, uh, is, is children. If, um, if those countries go on producing you know, football-sized families and, uh, and a kind of suppressed polygamy, then you will find this terrible side. I mean, how many people are there in Cairo now? 25, 30 million? I mean, that is, that is an awful drag on, on the women's emancipation of any sort. And uh, you can see how a, a kind of basic conservatism is going to be enormously popular, including things like honor killings. And decreeing democracy is not going to change that. It might, in fact, make it worse. Your observation, Ahmed, about, about the, the, the way things are moving in terms of emancipation and women, certainly in Egypt. Yes, um, well, we had a lot of women on, uh, the, on Tahrir Square. I mean, there were half of us were women, you know. We had them all the time there. It's just how the media chose to, to pick the elements they interviewed. Uh, and we, we were always criticized not having women. We had to actually bring women on the front stage so that we make that statement. They were always there. And I, so I want to ask the professor here, how many honor killings have you heard of in the past 20 years? So uh, I come from Egypt, none in my family, none of my immediate or remote family in, in the past 300 years had any honor killings. That's not an issue. Um, yes, conservative, con conservative, uh, conservatism is an issue. However, we have not had, it's not a threat, it's not a real threat, it's a proposed threat. So, yes, we need to work more. We have a long way, like Professor uh, Fawaz said. However, we have women movements since the early 1900s. Egypt is, yes, a, a, the leading a part of the Arab world when it comes to feminism, when it comes to culture. So, we have a better chance of becoming the model for the Arab world. That's why I believe if the Egyptian revolution succeeds, the rest of the Arab revolutions will have um, more of a, a momentum to bring about the change. I apologize to those others who wanted to intervene, but we've heard a lot of voices literally in the last 25 minutes, as well as the responses here from the six. So I'm going to close the floor, sadly, and ask you uh, to now vote with uh, the little card that you have. Uh, there is a, going to be a ballot box on either side in which you can place either one card or another, tear it in two, and if you still haven't made up your mind on the uh, motion, which is the Jasmine Revolution, the Arab Spring in North Africa and the Middle East will wither, up, then please put the whole card in. Right, could you do that quietly? Because while you're doing that, could I, could I urge a degree of quiet? Because while you're doing that, I want two minutes each over the next 12 minutes from each of the six panelists. Summing up from your position where you're sitting at the moment, we're going to do this in reverse order. Professor Jejez, the floor is yours to so try and pull together anything you want to from the floor and convince the audience on your position. Stay where you are. Yeah. Uh, let me let me 
let me summarize uh, my position uh, uh, via this motion is that uh, I hope we have made it very clear that change will not occur over time. We have not basically claimed that basically transformation, democratic transformation and consolidation would take time. We have also made it very clear that institutional building is a very difficult and challenging process. But what I don't understand, and why my opponent, our opponents don't make any sense, we know the case of the former Soviet Union. We know the cases of Eastern Europe. We know the cases of Latin America. Why treat the Arab world more in more exceptional ways and treat the former Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, and Latin America, where the lessons I mean, are very clear that it has taken more than two, case, two decades or so? But here on a personal note, a uh, personal note tree, really, wherever I, I have traveled in the last six months in that part of the world, wherever, whether it's it, what I have heard in particular is a, a sense of hope, a sense of hope that did not exist for the last 60 years uh, for the Arab world. Not only a sense of hope, a fierce determination, a fierce determination on the part of young Arabs, not anchored in wishful thinking about transformation, that of course in determination to transform societies. I come back to the point I stress, I hope, I stress in my presentation. What has transformed, what has changed in the Arab world is the mood and the psychology. There is no return. A rupture has taken place, and I would argue this particular rupture, that based on political activism and participation, will likely preserve the gains of the revolution so far and prevent the hijacking of the revolution by extremists or even prevent counter-revolutions. Professor, thank you. Um, now the first winding up uh, set of remarks from Douglas Murray. Well, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to first of all pick up and agree with the, la the uh, lady at the front here who mentioned the significance of women in this. It, I think it, it, it should have been said earlier. There is, a, there is something in common worldwide of societies that become stable, decent, thriving countries, and that is the liberation of women. That's the thing they always have in common, and that's what we must hope happens here. Somebody said peace, uh, asked a question about peace in the Middle East, and where hasn't been answered. I just very quickly wanted to say that um, one of the important things one must hope for in the coming years, whatever happens, is the retention by whatever regime comes in in uh, Egypt to retain, among other things, the peace treaty with Israel, which is, I think, key in the region, the worst imaginable time for there to be a conflagration again. Uh, thirdly, uh, somebody mentioned, uh, I, I, I mentioned at the outset, the, the problem of wanting to know whether or not there was a commitment in other democracies to assist, and I think one of the most practical things is not actually money. We don't need to pour in money at this point. But, uh, but pouring in people who know how to do things like running departments, like very basic stuff like uh, you know, account keeping within government departments, uh, oversight, all sorts of other things that don't require money but just require our commitment. Um, somebody said uh, the motion was wretched, and I have to say I couldn't agree more. Um, I'm very sorry. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a, a, um, a diplomat any more than I am a prophet, and this motion asks you and indeed us to be prophets. Uh, uh, I would just say this, um, I hope that we can come back and have this debate next year, in five years' time, in ten years' time, those of us around in some decades to come. I hope it's an annual fixture. And what's more, I hope that I and this side are proved wrong. I very much hope it, uh, but I would urge once again that uh, whatever our hopes, we also approach what is happening at the moment with caution and with care, and not to be blinded by our optimism. Thank you, Douglas. Now, uh, the second voice, the second summing up against the motion, Roger Cohen. I'd like to begin just by doffing my hat, so to speak, to the Arab peoples that I've witnessed um, uh, from Tunis to Cairo in, in, in the last few months. It's really been inspiring, and it's, it's one of it's the biggest, most pivotal world event in, in 20 years. And it's very important, I think, uh, that we get behind it, whatever the difficulties, and try to help this really inspiring transformation. A lot of Arabs have said to me, in essence, it's our turn. It's our turn now. After Europe, after Latin America, after wide swathes of Asia, why do we have to continue to be the exception? It's our turn for a degree uh, of self-empowerment. These are absolutely post-Islamist 
uh, movements. That's not to say Islamists aren't there, they're in the mix, but they do not dominate. Uh, words I didn't hear in Tahrir Square were Iran, Islamism, didn't even really hear the word Israel. Uh, it's about themselves, and I think the vast majority of Arabs are looking, men and women, are looking for some kind of decent balance between their faith and modernity. Islamism they've seen as a dead end. They don't want the West either, per se. They want some of those universal values, but they're looking for a balance, and I think in that balance, women will emerge and have been very important already in what's happened. The West um, has done quite a lot. Um, it was dismissed here somewhat by our opponents, but I was 15 miles from Benghazi. I saw the bullet and shrapnel marks on the walls 15 miles south of Benghazi, where Gaddafi's forces were in mid-March. If they're not there anymore, and if Benghazi is still free, uh, that is because uh, of the Western intervention. So do not uh, underestimate that. Finally, um, a lot of people are returning to these countries. The, a diaspora is coming back. Why are they coming back? They're coming back because they believe, because they're hopeful. And we should share that hope, which is why I hope you voted resolutely against the resolution tonight. Thank you. Roger Cohen, thank you. Now the second voice uh, for the motion, Professor Norman Stone. I think I've got three points. Um, the first thing is, if we're talking narrowly about the economy, the Egyptian tourism, I think, has spiraled down. God knows when it'll recover. And this must be general if revolutions go on in, the, in this sort of way. It's a, it's a, it'd be a catastrophe. The next point I'd like to make is, you know, uh, it, you said that, uh, you know, more or less bliss was it in this place to be dawn, uh, to be alive, and Roger Cohen splendidly says it as well. Uh, and you said it reminded you of 1968. I agree. Um, 1968 was the most pointless lot of nonsense. There were demonstrations in Grosvenor Square, which uh, you possibly remember, um, which looked like, like knees up Mother Brown. The, the general effect of the whole thing was to break the back of the Americans in Vietnam, and what followed? I mean, hundreds of thousands of people, millions maybe, driven into the Pacific, or, and the people like you simply sit, sit back and say, oh, how absolutely wonderful mm. that was. It mm. wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a terrible mistake to take that moment of popular enthusiasm because you wake up the next morning and you think, oh, God, what have we done? Norman Stone, thank you. The final voice against the motion, Ahmed Naguib. Yes, quickly. I think our, uh, the problem with our opponents here is that they still have the old glasses that they pull out from you know, the drawer, and their, their eye, eyesight has changed significantly. <laughs> they can't realize there's a, a significant, tremendous shift in the social and political paradigm in the region. I think uh, a lot of the problems we have here, not just in our, our part of the Arab world, but the world, is that there's a serious generational gap uh, for us, the revolutionists, the world changes at the click of a mouse. For them, it takes decades. Now, the other thing that shocks me, I hear some sort of rhetoric similar to the African American. African Americans are not eligible for civil rights or liberties. They're not ready for it. That is the same set rhetoric we heard tonight. Uh, no, but everyone is eligible at any given time for democracy. Democracy and democratic practices are different. We learn democratic practices, but democracy is a right given to us by God at any given time. These are our freedoms. Now, the problem is that the genie does not work miracles when he's inside the lamp, right? Now, the genie's out of the lamp and is working miracles. In 18 days, Mubarak was ousted. So I bet in 18 months, we can rebuild our nation. Let me tell you about the relationship with the military where every time when they're not responsive, there are more than a million Egyptians on the streets. They respond. They are scared. They've learned the lesson. Now, finally, let me tell you what I told my kids on the 28th when I went out on Friday with 30,000 people walking, marching behind me. I told my kids, I'm going out for your sake. 
and I'm willing to do it again. Thank you. Ahmed Nagib, thank you very much. Now the final voice uh, for the motion, Nora Ayman. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, I was one of the protesters in Tahrir Square as well. I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I thought that uh, people united in order to achieve a common goal. Unfortunately, they are now dividing, and there is no national agenda. That's, that's the problem right now. We are t talking about the post-revolution phase. There, there are prerequisites for democracy in order to succeed and in order to benefit the societies that we are living in. For example, there, there has to be some political awareness, political efficacy, political competence. And these are the cements of establishing a democratic state. But what is dominating the society right now is the subject culture, the, the enjoyment of discussing politics, of talking and analyzing situations as if it has been the norm. While people are participating on a very little measure and discussing the trade-offs between ideologies, for example, uh, there, there are several dimensions for, for the revival of citizens. And one of them is to activate the rational concept of freedom, where this does not translate into chaos and mess. The current situation is that people are suffering ignorance, political ignorance, suffering economically, uh, Adopting the code, code of subject uh, culture, not the participating culture. Uh, and therefore, democracy be becomes meaningless at this point of time. And it's used as an empty slogan. Thank you. Nora Ayman, thank you very much indeed. Well, uh, you've heard the six arguments and you've heard the responses to some of the points you've made, uh, hopefully all of the points you've made. I apologize for the, to those, once again, who couldn't intervene, but as you can see, I said we'd finish by 8 o'clock and we're about to finish by 8 o'clock. You've heard the voices from uh, the three, four, and against uh, the motion, and you've already voted. Uh, a reminder that the motion uh, abridged was the Jasmine Revolution, the Arab Spring, in North Africa and the Middle East will wither. I'll remind you how you all voted when you arrived. For this motion, 46. Against, 75. 55 of you didn't know. The result uh, of the vote in the last 15 minutes is this. For the motion, 40. Against the motion, 148. <laughs> But, but 12 of you still haven't made up your mind. <laughs> I'm sorry we haven't fully convinced 12 of you, but thank you very much for a very rich discussion here, particularly from those of you uh, on the floor who've come from the region and contributed that valuable insight, which has really lifted many of the points made up here. Thank you to you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.